All right. Welcome everybody to this webinar, which basically explores the idea of a school also being involved with an equine assisted services program in a general way. And I'm not gonna try and introduce everybody because they're much better at it than I am. So I'm gonna ask each of you to give us about a five minute rundown on how this works in your particular center. And I think I'll start with, with Deborah, please. <laughs> Debbie, <laughs> if you would tell us where you are and what you do. Okay, um, well, I'm, my name's Debbie Anderson. Uh, I serve as the executive director at Strides to Success, which is located uh, in Indianapolis. Um, we are a 38 acre farm that is smack dab in the middle of the city <laughs> and, and about 10 minutes from the airport. So um, it's, it's been an interesting journey um, being in that location because it has been rather convenient uh, for schools, which, you know, we'll talk about a little bit later, some of the, some of the barriers you know, that schools seem to have. Um, but our program is a, a um, program where kids come in as part of their school day. And they may just be there for about an hour and a half, sometimes two hours. We like them to get them as long as we can. Um, but uh, it, it's really interesting. We have been working in the schools for about 30 years. And as we went in there, um, I had no teaching background. I had no PhDs. I, I had a PhD from the School of Hard Knocks, and that's <laughs> about it. But a passion to serve the kids that were falling through the cracks. And so walking into the schools, not understanding any of the hierarchy, any of the the um the the red tape that you had to do it was it was very eye-opening just to go in there in all of my innocence and and observe what was going on and there were kids that were in in-school suspension that were in rooms with their hoodies up and their heads down and i thought what a waste you know they sit there all day and that's all they do so at the time um, I was with a, a therapeutic writing center and we were desperate for volunteers. So we started out bringing those kiddos out of in-school suspension, teaching them how to be a volunteer, how to serve others. And it was amazing in six weeks time, what would happen to their, to their body language, to their confidence, to their self-worth. And that's kind of what, what started me on, on the journey to figure out how we can serve those kids. Those kids may not have had a diagnosis. Many of them probably didn't even have families that were very um, involved in their education. All I knew is that they were failing and there was no reason for it other than they needed a different way to learn. And so that's kind of how, how we got started. And that led to a, a, a 30 year journey um, in you know, really looking at what the schools needed, why they were failing and how we could with our facility and our horses, how we could help. And uh, that's led to, to our work today. Great. So um, you can discuss maybe later how your school day goes, because we're going to go there later. But uh, next, I'd like to call on Michael. Michael Kaufman, would you introduce yourself and tell us what your program looks like? Oh, we can't hear you. You're muted. I'm being so diligent and good about muting myself. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Um, recognize a lot of familiar names. It's exciting to be here. Thank you, Horses and Humans Research Foundation. Um, currently, and for the last 18 years, I've been the director of uh, the Human Animal Interaction Programs, the nature-based programs at a school called Green Chimneys 
in Brewster, New York. We're about an hour and 15 minutes outside of the city. And uh, Green Chimneys as a facility was founded in 1947 by Dr. and Mrs. Ross, who early on had this idea of uh, running a school, of building a school in the country where children would be connected to animals and nature. Um, all these years later, we have grown. Uh, we serve 200 students in our main population. 100 are residential students. 100 roughly are day students. They all have psychiatric diagnoses. They are sent to us both residentially and as day students from school districts around New York State. So these are children who have failed in their home district um, either academically, mostly also behaviorally and socially, and a higher level of care is needed, which is us. Um, they come to Green Chimneys, and I may have mentioned ages are six to 18, uh, boys and girls, the majority are boys. And the average length of stay right now is three years in the program. So some kids stay quite a bit longer, some shorter, and we have a fully functioning PATH um, accredited center with about 20 equines, but we also have animal programs that involve farm animals, wildlife rehabilitation, uh, dogs, gardening, horticulture. Um, so there's a whole lot of other nature-based programs. And the concept is, is that the students go to school at Green Chimneys. We have a fully functioning regular school but during the school day and before and after the day, there are opportunities to learn at the farm, to play at the farm, and to uh, participate helping take care of the animals at the farm. I think in a nutshell, that's, that's kind of the history of Green Chimneys. Now you're muted, Octavia. That's right. No, I'm muted. Okay. I was trying to follow your good example there, Michael. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> so I do have a question. Is your school also itself an accredited school as such in the New York system? Yes, it's a New York state. Uh, it's a private school and uh, recognized we follow, have to follow state standards. Of course, because of our students, um, ability levels. Um, oftentimes, um, it's a special education environment. And so state testing and all is adjusted for that. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So Joanne, I hope you've got your... <laughs> I'm hoping my... Can everybody hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, we okay. Hear we're, we're having... We're ha actually having a thunderstorm, which is killing my internet. So I do apologize for no picture, but at least I have sound. Um, I'm the executive director of Brook Hill Farm. We began our mission in 2001 of rescuing horses. And along the way, we discovered the magic combination of horses and teens, um, how they help the at-risk teens develop life skills, enabling, enabling them to have success in school. Our youth have all kinds of challenges, such as emotional disabilities, learning disabilities, illnesses, eating disorders, and trouble with the law and abuse. So they really fall into two categories, students with disabilities and students who are economically disadvantaged. The horses that work in our program all are from county seizures, are lame, are no longer useful to their owners, making them unwanted. Um, professional staff, the Brook Hill School, we have three full-time credential teachers and a part-time counselor that run the academic program, and the students range in grades from 9 to 12. Um, we have 100% graduation rate of our students. And as a college professor of equine science, along with some of my colleagues, we wanted to know why we were being so successful. <laughs> and really we were, we're basing our uh, program on Dr. Shazar's solution focused therapy model, which targets the solution rather than the situation that brought the person to treatment. Um, we modified this theory to become solution-focused learning, where the students focused on outcomes, identifying the long-term goal of high school graduation. We, as a staff, design a positive roadmap toward the future by breaking down the goals into little pieces. Um, the method is not therapy-based, rather it's based on educational behavioral skills, which help the students be successful in school. Our students are partnered with one rescue horse throughout their time in the program. Um, we all know that horses can be motivators for them to stay in the program. And then we 
provide a teaching method that is action based, allowing our students to interact with their environment, including the people, horses, and of course, the green space of the farm. With the help of the horses, the students learn skills to foster resilience, helping them to be able to have positive adaptation within the context of significant adversity. They build confidence and self-esteem, increase a sense of mastery and self-efficacy, develop empathy through horses. They're learning leadership, teamwork, a work ethic, confidence, relationship building, and other essential life skills. And then we have college interns at the at the program hoping um, to encourage the kids to realize that they too can go to college. Um, our ki kids really ride well. We are a certified therapeutic riding center through PATH. And we work with a credentialed educator along with an equine specialist in mental health and learning. The difference with our program is our equine specialist also has a degree in child psychology. So she is able to identify the warning signs of youth in crisis and can work with the youth during the riding session. Our farm is the United States Pony Club Center using their curriculum for a riding program. And last year, five of our students um, earned the right to go to a horse show and they went all the way up to the nationals and placed six in the nation over fences. And I'm really proud to say not bad for at-risk youth on rescue horses. So was that through the, um, uh, the uh, well, it's not interscholastic? Um, no, no, United States Pony you? Club. United oh, States Pony, Pony Club, Club. yes. Okay, great. Um, yeah. So anyway, and the one thing that I really wanna to say too is we have a 100% graduation rate and most of the kids have either gone on to trade school, college, and we've had seven PhDs come out of our program. That's fantastic. Yeah. So uh, are you also um, and recognized school as such in Virginia? Yes. Yeah, we're a recognized school. However, unlike uh, Michael's school, we actually work under a regional school here and we're assigned a principal. I see. So, Yes. Yeah, slightly different. Slightly and, different. Um, so, Debbie, I'd like to get back to you. Um, if you could describe how your curriculum works with uh, another, the other school systems that send your people, because you're not a school, correct? Correct. Yeah, we are. We are an accredited uh, path center, and we provide multiple different uh, equine assisted services. So we have mental health practices that are located for actually mental health practices that are kind of separate, but our big thing and our, our largest program is the equine assisted learning program. Mm -hmm. um, we started out and the first thing that we did when we went into the schools was realize that there were certain conditions that the schools needed us to, to integrate into any program that we were gonna submit for their approval. One was they're in the business of academics. So academics had to be involved in any curriculum that we were presenting to them. Um, the other thing was that uh, they're accountable to taxpayers. So mm -hmm. you really had to, um, you really had to make the benefits you know, and cater to the benefits that were important to them. You know, you couldn't go in there and, and tout about how wonderful the horses are because that's really not what's important to them. Mm -hmm. It's about the results. It's like, what can you do? Can you, um, can you increase attendance? Can you decrease absences? Can you increase grades? Can you, you know, those tangible things that were meaningful to them? Can you, can you decrease behaviors in class that interfere with learning? And most of all, can you re-engage these kids that are, are shut down for whatever reason? You know, maybe they've fallen behind in school years ago and, and they got so far behind and nobody noticed that then the behaviors start coming, you know, because they're lost. And so can we re-engage those kids? And so those were the things that we focused on. We ended up creating a, uh, well, we call it the strides learning model, because the other thing that, that the school boards in order to pass contracts needed was something that's grounded in research. And, and they're really, at the time when we started, we didn't know anything about research. Research. I'm going to stop you in a just for a moment because we will get to research later. So that's okay. That's further down the road. 
but um, could you tell us, um, and for each of you, what does the day look like at your program? Someone, uh, you know, describe um, an average child coming from wherever they come from, what happens? So Deborah, go, go ahead since you're on screen right now. Okay. So when, when they come, um, the, the yellow Twinkie, we call it, or the school bus brings them. Um, they come in, we have a, a, a little line where we shake everybody's hand, we look them in the eye, we teach them how to meet and greet each other. And at first, you know, we, uh, they don't want to do that. But after a while, they love doing the introduction and the, the little receiving line. They come into class. Uh, they're gathered in class for about 10 to 12 minutes, as little as possible. And in the classroom, they are presented with the life skill of the day. And so our, our learning model is based on the Search Institute's um, developmental assets and then academic standards and then life skills. So the kids are presented with a life skill. And what we're interested in as facilitators to begin the lesson is what do they know about that? So for example, if the life skill is, is uh, responsibility, you know, what does that mean to them? Because we know what it means to us, but we want to find out where that learning platform, where, where we meet them at. And so, um, so we write on the board, we have big old whiteboard, and we talk about what is responsibility. And then we'll come back later after their uh, experience with the horses and we'll talk about what does it look like now to you and then why is it important and how can you use that in your life? Mm -hmm. So there's kind of a, we use a coaster model type of facilitation where we do check-in, we do the opening of the activity and then we do the activity and then we do um, a shift if needed and then a transfer of the learning. And, and each lesson looks like that. So it's kind of hurried in an hour and a half or two hour time, yes. you know, to get all of those in. But the transfer is, is probably the most important because if the kids are good at the barn, but the lessons don't transfer back into the education system, then, you know, it, it's, it's not going to be effective. Yeah, well, I think we'd all agree on that. Yeah. So um, that's great. So then, um, Michael and Joanne, one of you or both of you, uh, how does your day look? Who wants to go first? Michael, do you want to go? Of course, absolutely. Um, well, before we go to the day, we have 500 staff members at Green Chimneys. And that really includes everyone from psychiatrists to kitchen staff school staff, um, residential staff, um, the staff student ratio is very high compared to public schools because of the um, needs of the students. In the morning, day students come in for the day and they join the residents, they become one population during the school day. Um, at the farm, what we call our nature-based programs, we have teachers in each farm area. We have a farm teacher, wildlife teacher, riding instructor, garden teacher. So Monday to Friday, the students as classes, and we split them into half classes, rotate into these nature-based areas with riding being a little bit more difficult because we can really only have four students at a time riding. And in terms of supervision, it just requires a higher staff ratio for safety. But uh, once you have really connected with one area, students have opportunity to choose additional time in these areas by way of work uh, sessions, which we call learn and earn, where you are paired with an intern, maybe to come and clean stalls, to feed horses. Uh, after school, we have program staff that does things like drill team, the intent of all of our nature-based programs is to address exactly what Debbie talked about. The type of student who comes to Green Chimneys is often shut down academically, unable to keep up, um, 
has huge social uh, deficits. And really our job is not to be this fantastic academic school, but to really stabilize the child back into the ability to learn, back into the ability to sit in a classroom, to function as a group in a group. And that happens rather slowly. And the farm areas are really often the first um, area where the students can sort of decompress, uh, maybe reboot themselves because it is so different from what they might be used, used to. Mm -hmm. And I think a strength of our program, and it's one that we really encourage others to look at too, is to lengthen the amount of time that children can be with animals. Because we're often very focused on, you know, you come for your lesson, you have 45 minutes or an hour, and then you go back in the van and you go back to your whatever, where you came from, rather than actually living with animals uh, in all types of weather, being in nature. And so I think that's something very unique about our program, in addition to us really functioning as a treatment team. Uh, the 500 staff that I mentioned, we are all part of the same team. We work in trauma-informed models. We get additional training on how to work therapeutically with the students. Um, we uh, bring our individual skills, and then together we try to really support each student. And uh, that always uh, is, is very, um, powerful when it when it works and it doesn't always work it's hard work frustrating work and uh, I can tell you uh, it's not paradise I think everybody would agree with that so let's move on to Joanne you've heard the other two talk about their model as it were so tell us how yours is the same or how it's different Okay, our, our kids are paired with a rescue horse and that the rescue horse is their responsibility. So when they come in in the morning about 8am, they're responsible for feeding that rescue horse and taking care of it. Um, from there, they go and work on their academics until about 1230. From 1230 to 130, they have lunch and access to the counselor. And then they have their EAL program from 130 to 330. All our kids are either um, flunked out of alternative school. And so they're referred to by courts, by behavioral centers, by the schools. Um, and so they really struggle, especially with the academics. So our riding program is very academic based. We do a lot of our um, riding groundwork on actual like math, for instance, we, you know, if you think about dressage, it's very much geometry based. So we take those geometry theorems and we put them in the riding arena. So anyway, we'd spend about a third, you know, it's about two hours a day in the in the horse part of the program and the rest of it is with licensed educators on the academics. Okay, great. And um, Deborah, obviously your, Deb, your uh, model is very different. Um, yours is more portable in a way because these other two have this one wonderful specialized center which does nothing but the school and the horses. So do your students mostly do groundwork or do some of them get to ride as well? Most of the school, uh, school program is groundwork only. Um, we just don't have the time that Michael was talking about that you need in order to develop um, the writing program. But we did um, through our, our data collection Michael, you, you were so spot on. Um, we were able to prove to the schools that when the kids first came, it was like there's a honeymoon period and you wonder what, why is this kiddo here? Why is this you know kid been chosen for this program? Because gosh, they're great. We have no problem with them. And then about the fourth or fifth time that they come, it's like, oh, there it is. You know, and you start to see that behavior or that block or that challenge that they have. And so then our, our programs were at first, they were like 12 weeks long because that's all we could engage the schools with. Mm -hmm. And so at the 12 week mark, right at about that 11th or 12th week, we started seeing the, the, the charts go up where they were just mm -hmm. starting to get it. And so um, that was the baseline for what encouraged the schools to then develop a year-long program 
So the kids got to come for the whole year, which was good, even though it was only two hours a week, it was it was much more time that we could build on something and and really get some some better results. That's great. So I love the fact that each of you does really have a very different model. That's exactly what we're here for, to hear about. Okay, so um, now just to ask each of you to give an example or whatever of barriers that you've come across in, in providing your model. Um, Deborah, you said basically convincing the school systems that they should contract with you to do this. Um, but have there been other barriers that you've come across as you went along? Actually, that was the biggest one. I have a post-it note story. <laughs> so the first time I went into the director of special education um, with the Indianapolis Public Schools, she oversaw 7,500 students. And, and she had the most ability to manipulate um, travel and to get kids out of class and, and do all those things that would, you know, make it possible for the kids to come during the day. But when I first scheduled a meeting with her, she canceled on me like five times. And it really kind of, at first it, it, you know, I thought, well, she's busy, you know, and, and, and then it kind of made me mad <laughs> because I was like, I got dressed up in my city clothes five times to go and see her and she canceled on me. And the last time she canceled, I was actually in her office and, and I looked at her, her office and there were like three or four phones. There was like even a red phone, like, you know, you'd see in the president's office or something. <laughs> And, and I, I saw all the, the work that she does and I, I started to kind of get it, you know, that this is a really busy position. Um, it's a really tough position. So I did leave her a post-it note on her desk and I said, I have money for your kids, call me. And I, I just left my phone number. I didn't even leave my name. I didn't say what it was for or anything. And you know what? She called me. I put up twenty five hundred dollars as a, a little starter program, and that's how we got started. Wow! <laughs> yep, just because it's that personal touch. <laughs> so um, let's see. Uh, who, Joanne? How about you? Um, what I, you I think one one of the biggest problems we have is we there's no model to follow, and that nothing else was really being done like what we were doing. Um, we didn't really fit in with any umbrella organization, even though we're part of PATH. Our programs offer services that are very different than the typical PATH model. Um, also, like um, Debbie was saying, there's an awful lot of paperwork, regulations, et cetera, to get approved by the state of Virginia anyway as a fully accredited educational program. So, you know, I think, you know, the barriers for us started there. And then today, one of our biggest barriers is transportation for the kids. If they live in my county, we have the yellow bus as well. But if they're outside of our county and we're regional, we don't have busing. So, you know, it takes volunteers and, you know, parents and carpooling and everything to get the kids to us. Uh -huh. So, Michael, what about you? Well, I, I'm sort of thinking as, as we talk, there are really two big challenges that I see. One is time. Um, there are only so many hours in a school day, in the day for each child. There are always uh, competitions between the social worker needing time, the occupational therapist needing time, the classroom teacher needing time. Uh, then students have some other activities to do. So really finding enough time to be with the horses in the barns can sometimes be a challenge. One of the bigger ones is as a private school, Green Chimneys does receive state money per child. It's not the parent who pays for the child to be in care. It's the school district. And they pay a significant amount for the child as a daily rate uh, each day the child is in our care. That pays for education, for the school, for the medical care, the food. It does not pay for any of the animals, the animal care, or those costs. So uh, Green Chimneys annually has to raise almost $2 million to support the farm, the animal care, 
the staff in some cases. Uh, some staff we can bill as teaching staff. So that's a real challenge. And that's, of course, where Molly Sweeney's HHRF dream comes in, because very often the lack of the documentation and the research uh, still just makes it seem as something nice. Everybody loves the farm and the horses and the animals. But when it comes to actually paying for it, we have to go to private donations, fundraising, just like a lot of therapeutic riding centers do. And fortunately, we have a lot of people who, who kind of share the group dream, who get it, who, who support it. And, but that definitely, I would say, is maybe a weakness, if you can call it that. And that sort of segues into um, Horses and Humans Research Foundation. <laughs> so if each of you could talk about um, the research that you have, in fact, conducted and uh, in the past and uh, on an ongoing basis, uh, to support this general idea that we all truly believe in. So um, let's see. I guess, Joanne, I'll have you go first. Okay, so like I said in my introduction, we were kind of curious about why we were having such, such, such success. So some of my fellow colleagues at the college, decide, we decided to do a research paper which I do have available upon request if you're interested. And I think my email is there if you'd like a copy. Um, we really went into what we think, you know, was causing what was happening and why. Um, obviously, there isn't a lot of research in this um, field, which is, again, why I, why I support HHRF so, so much, um, because, again, we need more research because, again, with the school system, it was really hard to prove that this, you know, this worked. Um, our research compared the cohorts of public school students, those with disabilities and those from low socioeconomic backgrounds from 2008 to 2018. And we found that all 68 at-risk youth that participated in our program graduated from high school on time compared to only 80% of the public school students with the same diagnoses. And we know that 100% of our students entered post-secondary education or technical job training. And of course, we don't have any data about the school system. So like I said, that's available if anybody's interested. That's great. Are you um, currently um, looking at a different kind of research of any kind at all? Um, we do a whole lot of research with all the different colleges. And we just did a study on autism, which um, it's, is going to be published within the next couple of months. Mm, great. Okay, um, Deb, how about you? We've talked about research. How does it work from your point of view? Well, um, on, a, on a much smaller scale, <laughs> we, we decided, we wondered when we first started, how do the teachers, you know, grade the kids? How, what tools do they use? Because we felt like it was important for us to be learning their language and incorporating all of their, their ways into our program. And so we learned about rubrics and um, I, 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 they kept talking about rubrics. I'm like, what is a rubric, you know? <laughs> and so I learned what a rubric is. It's, it's um, and we created one that was specific to the horses. And so we measured 21 different indicators, things like um, level of engagement, listening, um, cooperation, treatment of, of staff, respect, all these things, 21 different indicators. And, and they were um, measured on a scale from one to four. And we clearly identified what each, what did a one look like? You know, a one would be, you know, just, totally disinterested, not being respectful, disengaged, and then a four would be the complete opposite, and then everything in between, a two and a three. So we kept these points on them and, and measured using these rubrics, and then what we would do is we would convert them into Excel sheets so that we could actually chart each one of those 21 indicators and it was really amazing because again, it followed the the um, the truth of having the kids come for a honeymoon period. They drop off, and then the chart very nicely displayed that you know around that eleventh, twelfth week is when they started to really engage, and then it was up from there. And so um, the rubrics were really helpful. 
but we also incorporated the teachers um, to gather information like um, the the behaviors that were happening in school or the lack of you know incidences. Um, they tracked grades for us. Um, they tracked attendance. They tracked all of these things, and we would gather that information as well. And and that really went over well with the um, the school board. They loved seeing that because apparently there's funding attached to seat time, what they call seat time. And so it affects their bottom dollar. So uh, the other way that we collected data was anecdotal stories from the kids themselves. Um, that was, you know, we'd ask the kids to write a paragraph. We do a lot of photography. And we would match that up and submit that to the board, uh, school boards as well. We also got into brain mapping, which was really interesting. Um, have a wonderful uh, scientist here that uh, started referring clients to us, and she kept telling us, you can rewire a child's brain with your horses. I'm like, dang, I didn't know that. <laughs> and sure enough, she'd do pre and post. And we were just getting started and we submitted um, for some, some big grants, and uh, which again is all new to me. Um, and and uh, so we're still working on that, trying to trying to come up with some significant grant funding that can fu fund that pursuit. Sounds like each of you has yourselves learned and developed all kinds of new skills because you're involved with these programs. Um, that's what I find. Even at my age, I'm still learning and, and it's all still developing. Ain't life grand. <laughs> OK, Michael, your turn. Absolutely. Okay, so 75 year old program, right? Hundreds of staff from psychiatrists to everything, all incredibly educated people. Up until about five years, people would come and say, so what research have you done? And we just kind of look at them and just <laughs> sigh and shrug our shoulders. We have no time to do research. We are practitioners. We're doing this work. We work with these kids. How are we going to do it? And then very quickly, they say, well, you should have some graduate students come and do some research, which sounds amazingly easy. And we would always have somebody pitch something to us. Oh, I want to come and, you know, measure your horses. But it just never really worked up until our very wonderful relationship with the Denver University um, Institute for Human Animal Connection, IHAC. And once we formed the partnership with that university, it became realistic for us to do a research project. This was about five years ago, six years ago. We are still in that project. Some things have been published along the way. The most difficult part was for the IHAC uh, team to come in and study our whole setting, how it works, what we do. Uh, we do some animal assisted therapy. We do some animal assisted education. We do some animal assisted recreation. It's all different things. We have students with different diagnoses. We couldn't do a control group in our setting because everybody interacts with the animals. Our staff team was very insistent. We cannot change what we do. We have to keep doing what we do and can't alter it for the research project. So in the end, um, a research design was created that uh, in short, and I'm not a researcher, measures um, the impacts positive youth development. That's a scale that's used. And it involved cameras placed in uh, classrooms, actually coding behavior of children after they come from the nature-based programs. And we chose not to separate whether they went to the horses or the goats or the wildlife center because we felt and, and Denver felt that some of the mechanisms in all of these nature settings are quite similar. And some of the outcomes that they've already published and that we have are, are very, very um, encouraging and impressive and they are available. Unfortunately, Green Chimneys doesn't own them. They are owned by IHAC. So we will need to connect you with uh, them if you actually want to get some of that information. However, um, you know, it has been very, very um, 
good once they understood who we are, once we understood what IHAC needed, their research team. And, um, you know, in the horse barn, for example, we have cameras now in the aisles that photograph the um, main area where the horses get prepared for class, groomed, cleaned, medical care. And so we now have another segment of the research which developed in the last couple of months where we're going to be recording the behaviors and the interactions of the students with the horses in that part of the, um, the program. So it's, it's difficult and financially uh, a research project is difficult too. Certainly once you start getting into you know, years of it and um, that really was an obstacle for us too and one that our board had to address. And of course, Denver was very generous with us and they donated quite a bit of their time um, towards it. Uh, but that's really our experience and it's a positive experience, but also an ongoing experience and it took a lot of years to get there. Okay, so I think they have your um, email, Michael. So if somebody wants information about- oh, just, should, just write just me, yeah, okay. please. Okay, um, okay. so um, I, a couple of more things um, really. So what advice would you have for somebody who says, gee, I think I'd like to get involved with the local school system. Um, what, what's a couple of things to really be wary of and, um, and then go for it? So who wants to go first? I'll leave it up to you. Who wants to think about that? I will. Okay, <laughs> good, good for you, Deb. <laughs> well, um, I, Along this journey, um, we documented our process because nobody else had had done this, you know, 30 years ago. And, and so we went from the post-it note lady, we ended up getting like a $250,000 a year contract with her for, for several years, for many years, like 15 years, and which was really great. You know, that stabilized our budget and sustainability and everything. But we're, we're a small center. We're not like Joanne and, and Michael. We're just, you know, we're just a, a small center. So to us, that was awesome. I think the advice that I would have is do your research and learn their language. We, um, we go into a lot of the different websites that have the statistics listed on the schools you can you can find out how many how many kids graduate how many get expelled what the demographics are um what the testing scores are uh i hate that but but you know where do they need help um is english a first language um do they need help there do is there a lot of uh remedial reading that is needed and you research out the problems because you are a solution. We have the solution for many of the problems that mm -hmm. schools have. And, and so if you can do your research and it's all available, all of, all of this is available online, I'd be happy to give you some websites if you, if you email. Um, but do your research understand their needs. I always even like to go in as far as um, get the strategic plan for the particular school system that I'm working with, because mm -hmm. there's funding behind the strategic plan. And so if you're part of that strategy, and if you can help them to achieve that strategy, chances are there's funding that, that will back that. Um, and so help them you know, see your value. And so it's, yeah. And, 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 and now we have um, your program to point to and say, see, they do it. So you can too. <laughs> and <laughs> because I think few people are going to create green chimneys or a Brook Hills farm, but many people might be able to duplicate what you do in the much smaller way, um, which is just still very effective. And that, of course, is the point of this whole discussion. 
So the other two, do you have anything to add? So I'd, I'd like to pigtail off Debbie. First of all, we're not that big a center, even though we okay. sound like we are. Um, <laughs> but my advice is what we found is having licensed credentialed professionals, that means educators who are directly on site and working with the program really helps your program be credible with the school systems. And when we started this process, um, again, we were just like Debbie, we, you know, the only difference is we had credentialed educators already working in our program. But once we were able to show that that's what we were doing, um, the school system then allocated, I mean, basically $189 per hour per student, because we had credentialed ed educators working with those students. So then again, it becomes a fabulous revenue stream for centers. And one of the things that I promote, because our mission at Brook Hill is education. So it's educating about rescue horses. It's educating about the school program, EFL, EAL, all the different things. One of the things we go out and do is say, yes, you can create a program like we have at Brook Hill if you have a classroom and you have licensed professionals. Mm -hmm. So please th don't think that you can't, because again, we have people starting this up now with the idea that you know, it is workable. And there is now more research showing that this works. And Michael, I'm excited to get yours. <laughs> <laughs> well, right. of, of course, you know, um, Green Chimneys is unique in the fact that our students come to us um, in part because of this identity of involving them in these nature-based models. Uh, but drawing on experience from even before Green Chimneys, I think three aspects ask yourself why are you doing this or why do you want to work with schools what is it that you hope to get from that is it money is it a certain target population is it community engagement what what is your motivator um the second piece is just to realize schools are in yet again a tremendously pressurized environment right now uh, there is Obviously, financial stress on schools, uh, budgets are an issue. There's not a lot of money laying around to do a lot of extra things. And the demands that the states put on schools are increasing. And of course, that's a struggle that prevents them even from going on field trips to the zoo, which they used to do. And many schools can't do that anymore. So keep that in mind. But I think any program that has had success, let's say a therapeutic equine program, pairing mm. with school, it comes down to individual relationship. You have to know someone or you have to meet someone who's on the school board or someone who's a principal or a teacher who has, you know, higher standing in the school. Once you have that person to sort of team up with, especially what Debbie said, they know the language of the school. They know the strategic planning maybe, or they know the terminology that might really sell your idea. Um, I think that th those three would be sort of my my thoughts. Okay. Hey, um, Octavia, we have, um, I'm just gonna eight, say, we have eight minutes. Questions? Yeah. So I don't know if you want any yep. questions, but also I would like to hear like one of their favorite stories yeah. um, from their school. So questions first. Is, is there anything out there that that we need? Yeah, Octavia, the, the one question that was there was about um, sharing a, a favorite story or a failing forward story. All right, so that's what we're going to do. All right, so I'm going to arbitrarily choose Michael to go first. Do you have a favorite story? Well, I, I have a current story, and it's it's not so much a favorite story. We have a young man who just turned 18, who is a student in the program, and who four years ago was struggling tremendously and very introverted, not speaking, socially isolated, um, fairly hopeless. And over the last few years, his um, real connections came in our horse barn to the point where he now is an apprentice um, in the horse barn. He um, knows a great deal about horses and he has become very competent in caring for horses, working with them, handling with them. He has completely shifted his mindset that a horse career may be something he would want, that he, he may want to work at a farm. And 
to, to see that happen, and, and it's actually rather unique. Not many of our students choose to go into animal careers. Most of them enjoy the farm, they benefit from it, and then they go back home, back into their school doing other things. But to kind of see his connection with the animals, his connection with the staff who works with the animals, has really reminded us how powerful um, this environment can be for an individual and how much it can change a life. And, you know, when we work with large numbers of students, you forget that it's about individuals. Yeah. Joanne? I think, I, think what, I think what my, one of my favorite stories is we had a young man who was headed off to an alternative residential school. He was very angry. Um, yelled at the principal a lot, um, wore, wore an ankle bracelet for a felony charge. He came to the farm and um, while he was waiting to go off to, to this residential school and just kind of, we taught him how to halter a horse. He said, this is too easy. Give me the hardest horse you had. Little did he know we had a feral horse that had just come in. <laughs> so we put him in the arena with a feral horse. And of course, what did he do? He spent two hours chasing this horse around the arena. <laughs> now that being said, Emotionally, he just kind of broke down and sat down. And the nice little horse came and put his head on his shoulder. Aww. So that being said, so we, so we asked him, what did you learn from this experience? And he said, well, his, you know, his demeanor was the problem. He came to that conclusion. So he said, okay, with this principle that you're having such trouble with, how are you acting? Of course, he said in the same manner. So we talked to him and told him, you know, let's try this tomorrow with the principal. Of course, we warned the principal what was going on. He went in the next day. Within two days, the principal was buying him coffee because he was also very manipulative. But when he went back to court, he told the principal he needed to be sentenced to Brook Hill Farm because that's the only place that he could succeed. So, yeah. Love it. Okay, Deb, your turn. Okay, what comes to my mind, we had the opportunity to work with a residential facility that uh, was specific for kiddos that have been sex trafficked. They have been, um, they had been uh, sent to this residential facility and they were to stay there at least two years because they said that's how long it takes to break the bond between the people that were trafficking them and, and, and it gave them shelter from there. So anyway, there was this one little girl. Oh, I'll never forget her. She had um, scars, massive scars all up and down her arms from where the people that trafficked her had kept her drugged up. And her, her little arms were just terrible. And she wouldn't speak to anybody. We got a little gray pony. Um, we've got minis. We've got a uh, mini donkey, and then we go to ponies, then the happies, then the, you know, on up. And, and so she was so terrified, she would just work with the pony. And, and she finally, she always had her hair down in her face, you know, covering it um, to as if she was hiding, you know, and, um, and Finally, after working with this pony, we do a lot of natural horsemanship type of stuff and really focus on the relationship and all that and the connection. And, and she laid her hands on this pony and she was just, just glued to this pony. And she just started crying and it just, the, the faucets just opened. And she looked up at me and she said, the pony doesn't mind my scars. Oh. And I was just like, oh my gosh. <laughs> so she, she stayed in our program for about a year and a half and the confidence and, and everything just, you know, fed into that. She looked forward to, to coming so much that she conformed in attitude and in participation, you know, when she wasn't at the farm so that she could come to the farm. And I, I hate it when the schools use our program as leverage. Um, I, I, I just, there's something wrong about that, but they do. And, and so um, they used it for leverage and it worked for her. And she's just, I don't know, makes well, me 
I think, yeah, I know. I think we're all we're all got big smiles Ooh. and maybe a, a glimmer of a tear in our eye when we hear stories like that. Um, thank you, three, all three of you, very much. Um, De um, any other questions that we have, Pebbles? Well, I wanted to just very quickly say something, Octavia, if I may. Um, we've talked a great deal about the schools, the children, what we do. I don't want to forget the horses. And I just want to throw a cautionary note in there. Um, working with students like we do at Green Chimneys is very emotionally difficult for the staff. It also is challenging for the horses. And um, there's a lot of emotion flying around, a lot of anger. And uh, we need to always be aware that the animals, you know, are at our mercy and we decide their day. So in the last year or two, we've started as a team to really talk a lot more about what co cooperation with the horse means, what choice means for the horse, and how we can really integrate the horses into this work in a way that doesn't just benefit the, the students, our program, but that also really meets their needs. Mm -hmm. And I want I want to segue just into that and give Pebbles uh, hats off to forming and Molly to forming the yes. HHRF well uh, horse well being committee because that is our entire focus on that committee. So thank you to you guys and thank you and Michael, have, for adding that piece. I have one more thing too. Um, if if you're interested in pursuing um, and and learning more about working with schools. Um, PATH has just launched a new equine assisted learning uh, certificate program that is um, the, the certificate program is kind of broad in and teaches about facilitation, but then the, there's micro credentials attached to that and one specialty is education and the way that the whole program will work is a lot of different people that have different programs that work with the schools will be you'll be able to choose from those so if you're if you want to specialize in a reading program there's going to be a a, a course there for you it won't be path but the the certificate program will lead to that and so if you're interested you might take a look at that um and and see if there's something that would benefit you. Well, <laughs> I can't top that. <laughs> so I think Pebbles, we're ready to wrap this up. It's been a wonderful discussion. Thank you, everybody. And I see much appreciation being shown in the questions. Any specific question that anybody has that we need to deal with? Octavia, we've answered those in the chat, unless someone um, has not added their question. Okay. Well, I think uh, it's one thing, uh, Octavia, nope. just uh, quickly, um, anyone who is near New York City, in New York City, if you have half a day, come out to Green Chimneys. We do professional day trips and visits and tours. We'd love to see you. And if you haven't been there already, please come. And yeah. watch out for those peacocks. <laughs> <laughs> They're very noisy and they're very showy and they're all over the place. <laughs> oh, I want to come see the camels, Michael. Yeah, and that too. All right. Okay, Absolutely. everybody, yeah. we'll wrap it up. Thank you so much, everybody.